good evening friends uh, we are back again uh, with a fresh and new episode for this growth wrap which is a series of fireside chat my name is ayush and i work as a growth marketer with zynga but at the same time i am one of the founding members of this community called growth folks talking a little bit about growth wrap 2020 so this is going to be a unique series wherein we will be having industry leaders from various different industry uh, on a fireside chat where we will be asking them some uh, questions we will be also taking questions from the attendees and we will see what's the approach and what's the mindset that these industry leaders have for the entire industry obviously talking from the brand standpoint but a, a little bit on the industry front and today uh, we are going to talk everything about gaming uh, industry and for that i have with me mr akshay bharadwaj he is general manager at zynga uh, a little bit uh, to talk about um, uh, akshay so akshay comes with um, close to 17 years of experience in business product and engineering across gaming fintech and digital learning business uh currently he is the general manager at zynga uh heading the global game portfolio of farmville game businesses and focused on building the new mass market games for worldwide audience uh previously he was senior vice president and head uh, consumer business at uh, at clear tax he was also uh, he he has also worked with adobe and at adobe uh he was the global head of products for digital learning and uh, spanning adobe captive adopt presenter e learning community and enterprise learning content so welcome on the uh, chat akshay it's nice to have you thanks ayush um pleasure to be here all right so uh, without wasting much of our time we'll start away with uh, my first question uh, so basically in this entire conversation we are going to have uh, uh, i i going i'm going to ask you questions about the pre covid era the during covid time the recovery phase and the current phase which we are in so first of all a personal question uh, you were in a fintech sector if i am not wrong and before that you were with adobe and then you are now with zynga so was the, like you had this in mind that you wanted to join a gaming industry or how did it happen uh, so for me like i i like to look at myself as uh, more of a student of human behavior okay and see how uh, you know how we evolve and behave in different situations right and how we can build products and experiences around it right so uh and from that perspective i think fintech was fascinating um and gaming itself uh is probably i could call a deeper study of the same right uh you know what motivates us to play games how do we engage um you know how do we build game experiences lots of nuances in game design monetization and so on right. uh and it's been a fun journey so largely i i think uh Gaming is such a vast space uh, that it's uh, you know hard to master in a short span of span of time. So I still consider myself like uh, still learning and a long way to go. All right, and uh, it's been over a year for you that you have joined Zynga, right? Uh, now talking about the uh, time phase uh, until March on uh, before March, how was how according to you was gaming industry since you entered the gaming industry and you had been managing a couple of portfolios working. so uh, cross functional teams for you how was the scenario before march or march 2020 uh, uh more specifically ayush what what aspects do you want me to cover there so you can talk about uh, the trends or maybe in terms of how you we were acquiring user or maybe you can talk about what sort of general scenario you had when you were targeting the customers in, in uh, within the product side as well yeah Sure, sure. And I think, uh, I mean, I don't think fundamentally anything has changed from, you know, mechanisms of how we interact and engage with users, right? Because you do have organic channels, uh, you do have inorganic channels, um, you do have in-game mechanisms, social mechanisms. All of that have remained the same. Right. I think the extent to which some of the channels have influenced uh, has changed in the pre-COVID to post-COVID era, right? And just in terms of uh just the quantum of user engagement right. and that is where fundamentally just organic user engagement has fundamentally changed i would say uh, uh gaming is very similar to any other product or business that you can think of in okay. terms of how you would reach how you would market right uh, i always think gaming is the space where it happens first and then a lot of the folks learn right like today when you look at um you know how you book a cab or how you book 
a food order and so on. All of it has a genesis in right. how gaming functioned in the past, right? So from that sense, uh, both in terms of channels to acquire experiences and so on, I don't think fundamentally anything has changed, but I'm happy to go into specifics if you want to want me to go into any, any of those areas. Probably uh, uh, the following questions would be covering those points. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So now, uh, now is like, just when your company got to know that, okay, the lockdown is happening, the COVID has hit and the pandemic is here. How did you guys respond to that? Because uh, ours is a company which was, which was not directly hit by COVID. Obviously, every one of us was got hit by COVID, but not uh, in terms, severely we got hit. So how did you guys respond to that? And did you quickly foresee the growth in the gaming sector or what was your first instinct? So uh, the first one was, I wish it happened very quickly, right? Like, uh, you know, what we did as a first reaction, I, qu I quite remember the day we did it. Because okay. uh, we said, uh, this is going to happen. So what we immediately did, I think this was about two weeks before the lockdown happened. Okay. We started to do dry runs in, in, in the sense that I think it was a Thursday. On a Wednesday evening, we decided that the entire team is not coming to work on Thursday. Okay. Uh, and we will do a dry run, right? And we did two or three iterations of those over time to make sure that one, everybody's able to work from home, right? Because there are, you know, device issues, electricity issues, bandwidth issues. And, you know, being in India, yeah. a lot of these things can be variable, right? Like, um, but we have worked through it, like all of those issues and, and specifically on the dry runs, uh, they really helped us sort out some of these things. Yeah. And also, I mean, uh, gaming is complex, right? Like it has a lot of functions which are like, you know, which are like artists, right? Like an art artist would need like a sophisticated Wacom device to create art. And that's right. not, it, it's not a regular laptop, which can't be transported overnight, right? So we, we quickly encountered, you know, these kind of issues. Right. Uh, what we then accounted for was, you know, like a, a gigantic operations exercise to make sure that everybody gets basically I mean, we carved out a separate uh, uh, fund essentially to give everybody um, home equipment they need, right? The right monitor, uh, which is a right monitor, additional keyboards, all of that stuff within the first month, right? To make sure everybody had a setup, which was not their office setup. They were able to work from home in because uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody could mimic their office setup as quickly as they could. Uh, the other aspect was we did not foresee the extent of growth we saw during that time, right? Okay. Like nobody anticipated it, right? That was unprecedented. So yeah. one of the key things, like when you look at a game is two things, right? You, like you have to look at what is pre-production, which is before the game goes live. What are the aspects of uh, the game that you want to look at? And then you want to look at production, which is live ops, right? Like you want to make sure that a game that is live will run as as per expectation. Now, both of those are very, very different areas. Like when you look at pre-production, you have a lot of collaboration, you have to do a lot of whiteboarding, a lot of creative exercises, uh, but running a live operations piece is, is execution, you know, looking at issues, going down deeper, looking at, you know, what cohorts are working, not working at, I mean, pretty much like any other business. So. We broke that down. Um, we also focused, uh, we made a very specific call that we will not release updates, right? Uh, we will not release updates uh, that will essentially put us at risk and destabilize the game. Mm -hmm. uh, we were seeing historic volumes of people coming in, right? Mm -hmm. So we did not want to destabilize the experience for them. So in instead we focused on, you know, what are, what are the core things we can do to make their experience easier, right? Like for instance, in the tech side, um, you know, looked at all of our um, infrastructure to make sure that the games are stable. Um, you know, on the support side, we, you know, we did what we could. Uh, we, and in fact, this was all coming without any marketing. These are organic users, right? So a lot of those pieces are taken care of by themselves. Um, and I think fast forward to now, uh, from there, like I think we have hired close to 100 people in a remote situation. I mean, we haven't met, right, uh, Ayush? So uh, we've built uh, two brand new teams uh, to build mass market games, right? Uh, worldwide mass market games. And we're already seeing success in those games. And none of these we even thought were a reality, like, you know, seven, eight months back. Exactly. We are working on the latest version of the FarmX game, uh, which is in my background, uh, Farm 3. Uh, it's currently under soft launch in India, so you should try it out. 
Um, and then if you're a developer, engineer, artist, producer, like we are hiring across all levels. So it's been a fascinating journey, right? So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot to learn. And uh, even from a personal and a team growth perspective, it's been, you know, it, it's, I would say at least 5x the learning that you would see in a normal year. Got it. That was really interesting. Now, uh, talking a little bit uh, about the uh, gaming industry overall. Okay, so India, we know, has the second highest population in the entire world. And comparing to other countries, India is still lagging behind in gaming industry. Uh, there is a massive untapped base for the gaming industry in India. What do you think would be the possible reason for this? Um. I think there are, um, you know, like, I would say there are some, first of all, I think it's it's a question that has a lot of history associated with it. It's okay. not a very straightforward question. Okay. Uh, and I'll give you some of the systemic forces that I think are in play here before getting into what's happening today, right? I think when you look at just the legislation that we have, right, we have the Public Gaming Act of 1867, right? Okay. It's 150 years old, but all of your gaming decisions mm -hmm. are made based on that act today. And it hasn't changed, right? And you're even making online gaming decisions based on that act. So that's how old it is, right? Uh, so one is that. The second one, I think, is a social acceptance of gaming, right? Like, I mean, can you openly talk about gaming across, let's say, three generations in a family, right? Obviously not, because I mean, they're, they're just the sheer acceptance is just changing with the younger generations, but sure. there is still a large association of, um, you know, the social association of gaming with like, you know, let's say throwing away your life or throwing away your time. <laughs> and, and, you know, all of these societal problems that we have had, which we have taken, a, I think, coming from a large middle class over time, it has been a challenge, right? What has changed, I think, is just the disposable income, right? Like in the past 20 years, what India has had in terms of disposable income, especially with the younger population, right. um, has meant that we are able to spend on gaming and devices. But before that, like we did not, right? And and while the other countries grew, like the West grew just in terms, like, like look at the 80s growth of, let's say the West in terms of consoles and so on. Like we never had the luxury or access to that growth. Exactly. So some of these, I, I, I just want to, you know, just do a throwback on these systemic forces that have kind of held us back. But that said, that is in the past, right? You okay. look at what's happening right now, especially in the past four or five years, like Geo has changed our world, right? Mobile is everywhere. Like okay. there are completely mobile first, mobile friendly format games, sure. um, which are just can only be played on the phone. You can't play it on any other device. Right. And India has what the last I looked, maybe 300 plus uh, million users who have played a mobile game, right? Okay. Uh, which is which is massive, right? Like think of uh, that, that, you know, roughly a fourth of our population has played a mobile game, like in the past four or five years, which is a big change. And it's, it's a sign of the things to come. Uh, I think the, the recent COVID situation, the remote work situation, while it's unfortunate, mm -hmm. uh, becomes a huge tailwind to this situation where uh, you have literally no forms of entertainment. Um, we have seen IPL this year have like, you know, record, um, you know, yeah. viewing numbers. Yeah. Um, so I think that is a sign that I don't, I don't want to look at India as being lagging behind. I want to see, I want to see as, uh, you know, I see that we are actually in terms of audience and engagement getting there, right? Uh, no other country, I mean, China apart, um, can talk of this kind of engagement that we are seeing right now in volumes, right? And uh, the one thing that we struggle even with games like PUBG is monetization, right? Like we've, I, and uh, there are many reasons for that again, but you know, that we can say for a different conversation, right. but um, but that is getting audience and engagement and having like just the mobile phone as a distribution platform mm -hmm. is fundamentally changing us. And I think right. in the next five to 10 years, I don't think this question will be relevant and we may be at the beginning of that curve. Maybe, yes, and hopefully. So, uh, very interestingly, you also mentioned about the generation gaps that we had and the amount of, of facilities that was not present in early 80s, 90s. But nowadays, almost every age group plays a game. Um, like, yeah. the market demographic are expanding, not only kids or youngsters, but older people are also now started playing some of the other games, especially on mobile phones. 
according to you how can companies target them what could be uh, the approach in targeting this sort of audience yeah yeah i think i mean and it's very very different right mm -hmm. uh, like i think uh, what we should understand is the ability to change behavior is very hard uh, even though people have adopted games i think um, like adopting games versus letting your kid or a younger generation become let's say a professional gamer or you know make money from gaming a very very different questions right but coming back to your question i think we should solve for the platforms on which these users are present first right okay and i'm saying when you say the older generation i'm just going to pick let's say 50 plus right just yeah. as just as a uh, demographic i think the inherent behavior what you're solving for becomes important like when you're solving for a younger 20 to 30 kind of an audience mm -hmm. uh, you know you have behavioral uh, challenges that you solve for right um, uh, which are inherent in us as humans right like things like validation or acceptance in society or you know conforming to a particular rule set these need not be very high in a older audience right okay. uh, they may want something that is you know super easy to use repetitive and habit forming in a very simple loop right i think a great example of this is candy crush right like yeah. it's not a very sophisticated game yeah. it has like like a gazillion levels yeah. and it's it's just repetitive right it's it's not it's not something that a younger generation will adopt right i think the other thing that i would think of in india like if you think of the biggest winner in the older older generations i mean i wouldn't i mean i would say non gaming but it's whatsapp right like WhatsApp. Everybody in India in that age, literally, is on WhatsApp, right? Now, how can we be more uh, inventive, out of the box, and use that platform that people are on to build gaming experiences in an intuitive way, right? For instance, are we thinking of voice the right way, right? Mm -hmm. Are we thinking of how we communicate fundamentally? Like those are the those are the pieces where I think in India we have opportunities to solve for. Yeah. Uh, and I think some interesting, um, some interesting experiences can come out of that. And that will be, you know, if you want to solve for the older generation, I think you should think of them as your primary user base mm -hmm. and not try to build a game for the 20 plus and then extend it to a 50 plus. Like that's not going to happen, right? Because the, in, the latent problems that you're trying to solve for are different. Yeah. That's my perspective. True that. And do you think, is there any key to suck, like to succeed in the Indian market? Is there any particular one or two things? Um, I know, I mean, uh, we have this thing of uh, the localization work in the Indian market, right? Like, exactly, yeah, uh, that was my follow-up question. Like, do you feel that localization is the thing or how is it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very, like the reason I it, the, it first came to my mind is because that's a very frequently asked question if you ask me, right? Because... <sighs> A lot of the Indian gaming companies think of the need for localization first. Right. The way I would think of it, um, Ayush, is I think it's a good to have condition, but it's not a necessary condition, right? Okay. Uh, just localization itself will not guarantee success. I mean, you've seen games like a Ludo, a Teen Patti, yeah. like Rami, all of that have succeeded. Uh, I think they have succeeded from an audience level. Whether they have succeeded from a monetization aspect, I'm not entirely sure because okay. I think they can still do when you compare themselves to their peers elsewhere, mm -hmm. I think their peers have done a lot better. Okay. In terms of how they've monetized, how they've engaged, how they've taken it to. That's but relatively for India, definitely, you know, we have to take a step and kind of appreciate that success. My take always when building games has been, Ayush, that, you know, it has to cater to a key behavioral trait or a latent need that the gamer has. Uh, and I mean, for those who understand gaming, you know that there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of psychology and behavioral science that has gone into it. Um, you know, like you can look at, I mean, basic, uh, you know, principles like the Fogg's microhabits model and so on, like which has helped you understand how people behave, right? right? How do you systematically change behavior over time is something that great games have mastered, right? I think we, that's the aspect that we need to focus on and getting users to enjoy and build those habits over time at the same time, you know, feeling rewarded for that experience. Right. So I think just, just localization definitely will unlock growth um, mm -hmm. to users who are new to the internet, right? Like, especially with Geo, if, if let's say Ludo is the reason you came to the internet, 
Mm-hmm. Yes, like it, it's always going to be emotional for you, right? Yeah. I think, I mean, I know we we probably have a couple of generations between us, but like uh, maybe, you know, 15, 20 years back, it was like your first email address, right? You always had an emotional connect to it. Yeah, yeah. You will keep it with you whatever happens, right? So if, if the game is the reason the user comes on and engages with the internet, that is a is a very strong reason right uh, and that's where localization works a lot right especially when you look at tier 3 india for instance like this could be the reason like either commerce uh, you know, making a basic payment maybe uh, or like a game might be the first reason they're coming to the internet and that's a fascinating um, thing right. so i think those areas it could be a, a growth driver but i would still insist that um, you know there are tons of games in india that haven't localized and succeeded right like take an angry birds yeah. uh, i mean take farm right like farm um, i mean you you're crafting like american foods and you're not even familiar of course there is you know the aspiration to look up to the west and all of that is there but it was definitely not localized and you take pubg which is more recent um, and there's a lot of games which are not necessarily built for an indian audience right with an indian audience in mind in fact there's a funny story of somebody who tried to localize farmville okay and tried to make rajma chawal uh, dal kichdi and all of that okay. on the farm game but it just bombed it did not work right so so uh, i think there are if you focus on the quality and the inherent core uh, you know like what we call the core loop mm-hmm. uh, in the game uh, you know meta systems that can actually uh, level up the user and build rewarding experiences and i think needless to say like the live ops or just the execution of the game once it goes live becomes the key got it all right this was really detailed one and uh, because i asked this because according to me uh, localization uh, played a very big role but yeah the points that you have mentioned it surely stands to it, it Now, is definitely i mean i would think it's a counter opinion yeah. um, uh, but i mean i think it's uh, you know sometimes you ask yourself what is the repetitive process for success right and i think just by localizing you don't improve your chances of succeeding definitely all right now uh, the other aspect of gaming which has emerged a lot in last few years is uh, game streaming that we have seen and like first of all what's your views like what do you think about the rise of game streaming audience all around the world like people are getting so many subscribers they are getting paid on youtube what do you think was the rise or what, what was the reason because of it rose so much yeah i mean um, i mean youtube itself is such a fascinating story right i think just take a moment mm-hmm. before you go to the streaming part to look at youtube right um when youtube i was looking at it like a few days back uh, youtube has like 2 billion users that access youtube every month right okay um, think of it it's i mean 2 billion users that access youtube every month i mean it is a staggering statistic right um i mean when you take um, i think internet users are about 4 4.5 4. 4.6 billion mm-hmm. and 80% of those users have a youtube account 80% of 4.5 billion oh. people have a youtube account right and 90% of americans between mm-hmm. like ages 18 to 24 have watched a youtube video right okay it is just i i think youtube is like the air of the internet i mean it it's there like i mean it, it's mm-hmm. everywhere right so what does that mean right you're you're actually your gaming is a subset a relatively small subset right because uh, i would still think entertainment is probably bigger uh, if you break it down so and and now come to the streaming aspect of gaming like you have these many people maybe like literally one third of the world uh, you know on youtube mm-hmm. right and now you're giving people a mechanism to also explore what the professional gamers do right okay uh, you know how do they make money like you know how do they actually play games right so think of it as um, you know like uh, there is there is a popular um, analogy in the poker industry in the us like till 2003 uh you know till televised poker happened um like poker never took off in the us and when they introduced the whole cam wherein you could see what the players did like you could see what cards they were dealt okay before any of the other players knew mm-hmm. you could know how they played right you know you know when they were bluffing why they were bluffing and now you had commentators who were experts telling you okay this could be what they're thinking right 
And that just grew the sport by more than 50 to 100x, which was crazy, right? And a, a similar analogy happens with game streaming. Like for people who are very new and do not understand the game, now you're looking at experts and looking like how okay. they play the game, how they deconstruct the game, what does success mean? How are they making? I mean, you're looking at uh, you know the Fortnite star who who made like who's 16 and makes like three million dollars in a tournament. Like, I mean, is that even real? Like, what is he doing, right? Yeah. All of these, I think, are fascinating, right? Like just just as stories for you to be um you know for you to be like amazed by and yeah. you want to learn by right and i think in india largely if you have to look at this um like probably youtube over twitch like twitch hasn't really taken off that much in india like um but i think youtube definitely has and we do have a whole bunch of youtubers in india who are making serious amounts of money um and of course with the audience readily available on these platforms uh i think two perspectives right one for a new B- uh, or a new audience, it's, it's good because you get to see and appreciate the games. But for the gamers also, it's great, right? Because you now added a revenue stream, which means that you know you can steadily make this your living. You don't need to go and work another job and also game, which is very hectic. That's not going to happen, right? Uh, and YouTube gives like you know you can pay your rent with what you make on YouTube, and if if you become massively successful, of course, that's a different story. But for ninety percent of or maybe even 99% of, of the pros that are streaming on YouTube, the money is good enough to pay rent, right? It's not like outlandishly amazing. You do have hundreds of thousands of followers who are helping you generate a living. And it, I think that's fascinating. Uh, I think the, the important perspective I should also is from the gaming company's perspective, right? Because you can now see how your power users play the game. You can see how your fans are engaging with the super fans. And then you learn to build gaming systems, you know, the metas um, and find growth better. Because one of the things that you look at other products in other industries is you want to know how to build your products, right? You want to know how are your users using your product? And here you're getting it on a platter. Like all you have to do is watch a YouTube stream, right? And look at the comment section and imagine the wealth of information you have. Right. So I think it's, it's been like a big boon overall for the industry. And I think it will continue to keep growing. Because every like it's a situation where all the stakeholders in this ecosystem, which is the gamers, the audience, as well as the gaming companies, are exponentially benefiting from this. Right. Uh, so I would definitely think it's a huge it's win. A huge thing. And not only just streaming, one more thing which has grew a lot in this last four or five years is fantasy sports. Yeah. And a lot of people ask this that is fantasy sports a part of a uh, gaming industry? So first of all answer this is fantasy sports a part of gaming industry or these two are different industries? i mean see i mean uh, you, you can look at the formalities right like but uh i would say they are i mean if, uh, there is they're technically separated as esports uh, and called out separately today mm-hmm. uh, but in the larger sense i mean i would think yes because they are they are very similar and maybe manifesting in a very different way uh but I mean, in terms of how markets view it, how investors view it, all of that is very different because, and the reason Ayush, I would think is the dynamics of both of these businesses are very different. Mm. Uh, like if you look at a mobile app uh, versus a physical event, mm. uh, right? Like where you're running a game, a competition and so on there, the dynamics are very different. The revenue models are different. All of that is very different, yeah. which is why you might want to look at this as two uh, separate things. But from a user view, you can always go and like what the pros are playing. You can download an app and play it. Like, I mean, there, there's nobody stopping you from doing it, but achieving mastery is going to take a lifetime, right? Like that's, that's the beauty of these games. Right. That's there. And do you think, okay, we got to understand that fantasy sports has a little bit different and it comes under the same family, but it's still different. So yeah. do you, do you think uh, the rise of fantasy sports, it's going to take away some shine from the gaming industry? Um, I think, I mean, see, the gaming industry is so big, right? Like it's, uh, I mean, sometimes we don't understand how big it is, right? It is, I mean, it, it's, um, you know, it's greater than like, I mean, I think the overall gaming industry is close to 200 billion, right? Uh, and just mobile gaming is touching 100 billion, just mobile gaming, right? Which is you and I downloading apps and playing on our phones. It's a 100 billion business. So 
you can't name that many hundred billion businesses that exist on the planet. So, um, fantasy sports is nowhere there, right? Uh, and and it is it is definitely, I mean, it will take time to reach there. But I don't think necessarily that will cannibalize mobile gaming because the audiences for mobile gaming can still play, right? Uh, and has much much wider audiences than when you compare to like fantasy leagues and sports, which is I and mean, one is uh, one is where you're engaging with the game. The other is a spectator sport, right? Like, um, so yeah. I think both of them will exist in my view. Mm-hmm. It will turn down to it will turn it into a competition for the the player's time or the user's time. Yeah. I mean, whoever wins that time will yeah. win more. I mean, similar to like a Netflix versus. I mean, it, in that way, it's a Netflix versus a game. Netflix versus fantasy fantasy leagues. Right? You have only X hours in a day. Where are you going to spend it on? That way, I wouldn't compare it to just between these two. I think all forms of entertainment and all your other options, work, sleep, food included, are all completed, right? There's a there's a famous saying that Reed Hastings had said some time back uh, when he was asked what's the competition for Netflix. Okay. Uh, this was four or five years back. He said the only competition for Netflix is sleep. <laughs> uh, if they, they would always watch Netflix. So. Um, wow. Yeah, that's just uh, on a fun note. Brilliant. All right. And again, uh, you mentioned that out of 200 million, if I heard it right, right? Out of 200 million, 100 million are mobile uh, mobile users. Yeah. So, so this, um, was, this was a revenue. That was revenue. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, but again, it, uh, it still shows that so many people are there on the mobile devices. Yeah. And we know the fact like, like OTD platforms are somewhere destroying the TV industry. And we, we all know that many people or many companies have started launching mobile centric games like PUBG, Pokemon Go, Fortnite. So do you think uh, like mobile gaming uh, industry also destroys the other different type of gaming domains like Xboxes and PC? Or we are going to you have to look at history to answer this, Ayush. Like, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I've been like studying this for some time, so I can give you like a broken down, um, study here right so um see what's happening is mobile is exponentially growing right like and it is the way you access the internet like and as you'll have more and more underdeveloped nations come on to the internet right like today like four and a half billion people on the internet now technically anybody who comes on to the internet from now is going to come on a mobile phone they are not going to buy a laptop and come on a laptop right so the distribution is amazing, right? So this platform did not exist like a decade back. I mean, think of it, like in one decade, it has fundamentally changed how you access and, you know, um, you know, view and do things, right? So it's, 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 a, it's becoming a daily need, right? So you, I don't think you can change that. So mobile platforms will exist, but at the same time, you look at, I mean, what are you competing with, right? You're competing with PC and console largely, right? Like when you look at, um, you know, uh, like a, a, a PS5, Xbox, I would put all of these under consoles right. and I will look at PC. Like when you break down the, you know, 160 to 200 billion ish, like gaming market, I think about 40 billion is on the PC and still 30 billion is on console. And PC is actually technically in the recent years been growing, not at the pace of mobile, but it's still growing. And the reason being, there are, you know, great processors, um, you know, all of that technological advancements are coming to the PC. And when you're at home or when you're in a fixed place, the preferred device for gaming shifts to a PC a lot of the time, especially in the younger generations. And also the quality of gaming experiences when you're looking at more sophisticated games. Yeah. Mobile as a form factor is not good enough, right? I mean, it's not good enough yet to deliver those experiences. And you also have the physical limitations of a mobile device when you want to play, um, you know, a larger scale game, right? Uh, the other thing that's a tailwind, I think, in the PC space is all of the cloud gaming services that you know Microsoft has launched, Nvidia has launched, Google has launched. We, I mean, all of them are betting on cloud gaming, which means that if your PC is not as fast or you know not as good, doesn't matter. If you have a good internet connection, you will be able to play. 
uh, from a console view, like, you know, PlayStation, um, you know, I think the biggest one, of course, like we should not miss that is Nintendo Switch, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's, it is the rage. Uh, it will continue to, you know, uh, you know, continue to do well. A lot of the more modern games are launching. Um, I think just yesterday, Among Us launched on Nintendo Switch yeah. as a cross, cross, I mean, cross-platform game, right? Which means that if you're a console user or a mobile user or a PC user, you can all play together. Like yeah. there's no difference between all of these. So which means that, you know, this is going to stay. Um, and while PC, and I think the way we should look at it is the entire gaming industry is growing. Mobile is growing at a very fast clip. Yeah. But I believe PC and console will also grow. I don't think it will come at the cost, one at the cost of the other. Understood. And uh, you uh, you mentioned in between a little bit about cloud gaming, right? For right. the audience or for the wider audience, you can can you explain quickly what exactly does cloud gaming mean? Yeah. So cloud gaming, see, I mean, if you look at it inherently, the core problem is, I mean, what restricts you from playing a game well, right? It means that the quality of the experience can be bad due to two reasons. Either the hardware or software on your phone is bad, or you have bad internet, right? One of those two. Now, one of those can be solved very well, right? Uh, like in India, we are solving both very well. Uh, but the smartphone problem, which is the bad device problem, we've been solving systematically over time. I think the quality of affordable, good smart, smart smartphones is at a good place and it will only get better. Like you will get much better smartphones at a cheap price. But the cloud gaming aspect is to, as internet is becoming more and more cheaper and accessible, right? And of course, like the elephant in the room is next year will be 5G. We'll come to that. But uh, as all of this becomes more prevalent and, and uh, it will mean that you can actually, like you and I can play a game without actually having very good hardware or even an app or, uh, you know, none of that stuff, right? We can just get on to, just like how we saw a website, yeah. we could get on to a game like it was just, uh, you know, a, a skeleton. Uh, right? And all of the gaming experience is delivered from the cloud. Like you have nothing sitting on your phone. Um, and it's pretty much like what streaming did to video, right? Like, I mean, if you remember, there was a day when we used to transfer, yeah. you know, unhealthy sizes of video, uh, you know, hard disks and, you know, you know, many, many uh, viewers here might not even like have seen that age and day, but I think streaming fundamentally changed it. So I think that, that uh, is, that's, and it's the same thing that's going to happen uh, with cloud gaming. All right. Thanks a lot for the answer. Now, uh, so while researching for the questions, because uh, I'm also a little bit fairly new to the gaming industry, so as per my knowledge, but at the same time, while researching the question the other day, uh, we were having this team meeting and people were discussing a lot about VR games. Uh, so this brought me to this thing that, okay, what exactly are VR games? But at the same time, why it hasn't, so, why it has not been so successful in India? Yeah, I would say VR games like worldwide haven't been successful. I would not say okay. uh, India. Like I'm, I'm saying this relatively, right? There have been like one, one of successes here and there. Because uh, my um, take is VR as a mechanism is just not as enjoyable yet, right? Okay. Uh, like when I was at Adobe about four years back, we built the world's first VR authoring experience where you, without programming, you could build like a VR experience. It could be a game. It could be you know, a learning experience. It could be a bunch of things, but it just did not take off, right? Uh, because the consumption side of the equation is still broken, right? And there are a few factors, right? Like relatively the price of a VR device is still quite high. Uh, the content that you, that really uh, like, you know, gets you in for a VR is not that good, right? And the volume isn't there. Right. It's still a very niche kind of uh, experience. There are not enough viable business models. Like, I mean, what if you were building a VR company, like how do you take it to market? Like your consumers don't have it. Uh, there are no marketplaces that make sense. So you, you have to build the entire ecosystem. Right? Like if you're building an app today, you know that there is Google, you know that there is Apple, you know that there is this mechanism called an in-app purchase. You can put it in, you can you know charge via subscription. All of these models are built and adopted for you to move to, uh, but what are the viable uh, options on a VR world doesn't still exist. I think the biggest one from a user perspective are just the health effects. I mean, if you've tried it, like I remember the first time I tried VR, mm -hmm. it, it was nauseating, right? Like okay. 
it is it is not and i'm i'm not talking of you know peripherally doing it for 5 minutes like if you use it for 30 to 40 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. uh you know you feel like your vision is blurred it is nauseating and it is disorienting because you exist in the real world mm -hmm. but you're kind of doing all these ranges of motions which your body is not used to yes so so the tech essentially hasn't like one the tech platforms haven't standardized there are no standards like exists for app web and so on um and it is a very consistent feedback that you see i mean if you research on vr experiences today uh, like nausea is probably the number one reason people hate it uh, and there is no real reason to go mass market yet right like i mean you can exist without vr like it has to have a real compelling um, reason for a user to go there and uh, i mean people like i mean have explored a bunch of things uh, but you know none of it has become mainstream yet and i think a lot of these things um, you know add up uh, for vr uh, but that said like i think i was uh, reading in a research report somewhere that um, you know in 5 years in i think 5 to 10 years uh, uh there is uh, a case being made in terms of hardware and and um, you know where the push is going where the vr devices will come as good as a contact lens right like you can you can wear the vr device as a contact lens and if fundamentally something like that happens you will you will see an explosion because then just the friction to try it out and and maybe even elements like the health effects the nausea the disorientation which is just your mind fooling yourself right like it it is all of that goes away right uh, i think if it's as good as wearing a contact lens like imagine i mean that would be the day i think we are just becomes mainstream yeah that's great all right so till now we have had discussion around uh, what was the gaming industry pre covid what was uh, uh, your approach and how china approached and in general also what was the approach for the gaming industry in the recovery stage now now i am considering this as a post pandemic because now the normalcy has started to be restored things are opening up do you think um, like they have predicted that uh, the usage of mobile phone will dip a bit because uh, because of the sense of freedom that people will get after a year so uh, do you think uh, is this going to hamper the growth of a gaming company if uh, yes or no um i think it's a tricky one ayush and it's not as simple as it looks mm -hmm. uh, and i can give you some of our own experiences in zynga um okay. right so when when the covid uh, pandemic when the pandemic started um you know we saw like i said unprecedented growth in q2 right uh, but post q2 the growth actually dipped i mean we are still in the middle of the pandemic so there was just this quarter where people were forced to change their behavior but the behavior was starting to normalize right and we actually saw pretty aggressive dips post q2 right True. so it was stabilizing to a normal and and this happened in uh, gaming behavior it happened in uh, you know ad spends it happened in a lot of places around gaming where the baseline behavior was getting to be established right i mean you should think of it from a user view the you i mean the players are still working from home right they're doing their jobs they're doing all of their other things they need to run their life within parallel it's yeah. not like they're gaming 24 hours a day i mean it's like you know they got this time and you know there was all of this extra things that they could do but quickly i feel like at at a, a societal level we figured that we have to live our life we have to still do our other things and we have to normalize right um and in some cases like in my own teams people are actually inadvertently working more right like because you your boundaries between work and home and all that are you know are cut and that's i mean that's a completely different story i mean but coming back to your question like some of the world we existed in the that existed in the pre covid times isn't coming back right like in the sense that we don't have we haven't accepted it but i don't think we'll return to a world where we'll go five days a week to office right we may go to a world where 30% of the office might come yeah. and 70% might just work from home right i mean in industries where this is like gaming is a great industry to make something like that happen right um like i think an optimistic view that i have is that we will retain a good chunk of this baseline i don't think it will be as bad because this this perception that we have of post covid mm -hmm. is not the world that we left when we came to covid and i think that's the mistake that people make oh, yeah 
it's basically a different world that will be kind of invented based on the learnings we have in covid and the post covid world is world is going to drag it's not going to be like one day you will have it like i think all of 2021 is post i mean we are in that you know you know right. figuring out how to deal with it and i do get a sense that a good chunk of 2022 will also be that way yeah uh, and that's the time in which like you know the smarter companies and companies that are resilient will figure out what retention strategies can be employed to engage and keep their engaged players right and how do you reward them for the time that they spend on your games and apps uh, and that's the way i see it right i don't see it as again like harsh dips but steady declines which will give you enough you know time and space to react and clearly anybody with a, a solid player first view of games will again win right which was what happened in the covid time also right not all games succeeded yeah only games that were organically very stable and built from a player first view when there were a lot of games that didn't do well i mean we don't talk about it but there were a lot of games that didn't do well that's clear that and do you think uh, now in the post pandemic thing of uh, retention is going to be the key uh, rather than ex- 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 acquisition or how i mean for me always right like i think retention is like the is, is the thing right like uh, uh i and i know i'm talking about this in a growth folks uh for you would probably think acquisition is is a number one thing but retaining is always a ma- magnitude harder than acquiring right? Right. And, and and it is something that we have to understand right because um you have a you have a person who has for good reasons chosen to spend time with you in their own way in your game uh the cost of losing them so much further down the funnel is always high right because you can always be smart about acquisition right you can do blended you can do organic you can you know optimize your spend and you can do a lot of that stuff to make sure that you can keep your you know cost per installs down make sure that uh, you know you get the right audiences and all of that is is also hard i'm not discounting it but retention is i mean for me like just the mother metric right like you take any great not star game. metric that is yeah. if you build great retention everything else can be solved for right like and it is one of the hardest things to solve for in a game or for that matter in most apps yeah that's good all right and uh, uh i'm having just a few questions left so anyone who has joined us today on facebook and on this webinar as well feel free to shoot your questions in the q and a tab uh, we have already received four questions so uh, meanwhile i'll complete my set of questions and you can shoot it in the q and a tab so uh, yeah. coming back to the entire conversation akshay uh, do you think like this pandemic has been a setback for all the industries and it is a sort of setback obviously in some of the other ways for gaming industries as well but still do you think that um, having all of these setback at the same time having so many technological advancement that we are having like something like 5g yeah. do you think it's going to help gaming sector for, like gaming companies for whom the audience is india the market is india i mean i think 5g is um, is going to be a step curve change for india like i, I don't think like what jio did on one level just by accessing internet might not be in the same magnitude but i do anticipate that uh, 5g and again with reliance itself can be like a fundamental game changer and i think we have to just step back and understand what 5g is before we go into you know how it's going to change right like what is 5g fundamentally right it's 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 basically a framework or a technology with like a significant significant increase in speed and responsiveness it's not what 3g to 4g was right it's not the same level it's it's a significant change like in a 5g network you could reach 20 gbps speed. like think about it 20, 20 gbps right that's the speed that you could reach now what can you do with 20 like what do, what is 20 gb today right it is like 10 movies right yeah, it is too much it's it's a lot of content imagine um and there is there is no content format today hmm. that is so rich that can fit 20 gbps like so so our mind will is warped to think in the content we have today right okay. so think of what can happen if you have it basically think of it as 
you built roads where you could go 200 kilometers an hour and all you had was a Maruti 800. But once the roads opened up, you saw that I can now build faster cars. So, so there is, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a loose analogy, but it's basically something like that, right? So the kind of content and the kind of apps that you will see will be not something you can think of today, right? So it's, it's a huge opportunity for gaming companies to just, you know, just stuff uh, games with a lot of rich assets, a lot of rich experiences that can't be delivered today. I mean, I have Farmville in my background. One of the biggest challenges we have is just, just you know, the magnitude of art we have in the game is just mind blowing, right? And sometimes we have to optimize for it because yeah. players, the networks can't take it, the devices can't take it. So we spend a lot of time in optimizing. So 5G takes away that. Um, the other big thing is just mobile cloud gaming, right? Like you will start to see some real, real cloud gaming happen on the mobile itself. And I think, um, you know, I mean, again, like not something like you and I can imagine right now, but there are a lot of prototypes and ex experiments being done right now. I think it will be a big boost to streaming, like, uh, because now at 20 GBPS, like, I mean, you don't, have, I mean, nobody ever will complain of, uh, you know, a bad connection or the inability to access, which I think still does happen fairly often today. And a few uh, days uh, before, uh, like, like this, yesterday itself, uh, Man Zuckerberg met Amani, uh, one of the Amani's, and uh, I also heard some few weeks ago that Facebook is now Facebook is now becoming much more uh, gamer centric. They are asking gamers to stream on Facebook, so this is like a win-win thing for them, right? Yeah, I mean, imagine like a gamer, you hit a button and you stream at five G speed. Yeah. You don't need to worry about anything, right? Like it's, uh, I think it will become just an accepted form of life. Yeah. Like it's going to, you're not going to worry. You're not going to ever talk about bandwidth, speed, bad connection. All of those hmm. just become history. Like, and it will address the long tail also, right? I think multiplayer mobile gaming will just take a huge boost because now everybody can get on and have like real time experiences. There's no lags, right. just quality of experiences. We spoke about VR, I think VR, AR, mixed reality, all of that stuff will get a huge boost because VR is a format which is very content and data heavy. If you're able to transmit that at a much smaller, I mean, much faster pace and at the same time, hardware is getting better, uh, you know, for you to access on your face. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, that convergence will be like another uh, big story. Yeah. I think like we see dynamic in-game advertising, right? Like. Uh, all of that doesn't happen in a game. Like now with, uh, um, you know, with 5G coming, all of that could happen. Uh, one of the big things I think that will change is I think mobile network providers will drop the data caps. Yeah. That won't exist. You will not have a plan which will say you can only use 100 GB, 500 GB, 50 GB. All of that goes away because it's, it's a ridiculous thing to say that you have a data cap, right? When you're coming at 20 GBPS, right. um, Right, and there are there is no content that is 20 GBPS. So why does uh, you know it doesn't add up, and that will mean you can play endlessly. You're like an unlimited subscription, without worrying about data caps. So you play without any um, you know any filters, right? Like any time filters or so on. I think the last, I mean, couple of things I feel is like haptic feedback, right? Like very specific things. We don't add it in some games basically because it delays the experience, right? Right. It, it, but now you can do real-time haptic feedback, multiplayer haptic feedback. It, right. it's, I mean, I'm fascinated with the possibilities. And the last one, I think, is just battery. I think 5G is a more efficient technology. Battery will last longer. Okay. And I think, I mean, companies like Zynga will create like hugely better play, I mean, um, games like through 5G. And that's my perspective. Definitely. And uh, you already mentioned about that the arrival of 5G is something that we can um, keep an eye on in the future. But um, like at the same time, a lot, a lot of reports, uh, they also see India as a very a big market and business today uh, reports uh, suggest that the Indian gaming industry is going to be worth 1 billion by 2021. Yeah. So do you think arrival of 5G, uh, that is surely going to be one thing, but apart from that, are there any other advancement trends or yeah. something which we can like look forward to in the coming year? 5G is definitely going to be a huge thing, like you said. 
the two things i would just call out are like one is being player first right like understanding your player right. base deeply just like the one on one of everything right like uh, uh, i mean like when you play a game or a sport or something like you know that there are certain basic things i mean when you like for instance if i mean if you're a cricket player the one on one is like keeping your eyes on the ball like i mean you can't you can't miss it you can play any technique you want yeah. you have to keep your eyes on the ball and i think something similar to gaming is just being very close to players and understanding what drives them what motivates them what environments they are in i mean whoever has the best understanding of that will win this market aggressively right like uh, and sometimes we do have latent needs which we don't express and whoever is able to get to those latent needs faster will win i think one space i would want to call out which we should pay cl- close attention to is the hyper casual space right like okay. where the shorter format games uh, which are taking off in india right i mean if you have followed the more recent numbers they've been taking up they've been a few studios in fact we at zinger yeah. like one of my teams is also building uh, mass market games in the hybrid casual space okay so i think that's an area we need to pay close attention to because there are huge cohorts of players who want to just do you know short game sessions few minutes and come in and go without having any emotional attachment to the game right because you're just basically killing time right you're not uh, you don't want to come in and for instance uh, sit on a farm and nurture crops and you know engage with uh, social and so on so there is this transactional form of gaming which is taking off and i think that might also be a huge key to growth um, uh, you know going forward all right and yeah uh, i guess we have got a lot of questions already uh, one of the questions that i'm going to pick is from girdhari because i wanted to ask something related to the same so girdhari wants to ask you ask you that my 15 year old wants to make a career in gaming exploring how to create his own game what would be your recommendation to him also <laughs> to suggest a mentor for him <laughs> yeah i mean one of the things uh, girdhari is like um like one is to um just get like your son to create a game right like i think just that without worrying about the details about how to create it you know like take a very simple game which could be a tic tac toe or it could be uh you know a simple game that you play at home right which is with the rules of the game are pretty simple uh there are a lot of uh you know platforms out there that help you do it like one of the best things that i like especially maybe 15 years older but Uh, is mit scratch right like it gives you like a very basic platform for you to go and build you know a gaming mechanism so i think two things one is how games work the second is how technology works right like if you're not familiar with it how do you build an app you know how do you learn programming all of that become important uh, of course a game is a much much more complex thing right but i would just uh love for him to just experiment to play and try and build something of his own and to a certain extent i would even keep the technology element aside like if you can build it without tech even just you know by hand and get 10 people to like the game because the hardest thing in gaming is to get those 10 people to like the game right can you build an experience that you know 10 people like or even five people or just your mom and dad like i think that is a starting point uh and in terms of a mentor like you know i can leave my email like you can always reach out uh, uh we can figure out a way uh, you know if we if everything works out i'm happy to have a chat with him all right thank you uh, uh for the question here dari uh, i hope you i guess you wrote that your son was listening to this so i hope uh, you got his answer uh akshay uh, we have got a lot of questions and we are already running short of time so what i'm going to ask you to do is that you have a one minute gap of answering all the question okay so, uh, i can yeah so i'll go first uh, with shobhit uh, shobhit wants to ask you that do you think localization also varies country wise uh, like in japan most of the major games are based on popular anime definitely i mean in, in japan like just anime language culture all of that plays a huge role um, and uh, i think japan is one of the uh, countries where technology and all of that also took off very early so they have built like indie games ingenious i mean indigenous games within japan uh, i think that will happen in india also we are just at the beginning of that curve right uh, and i think the answer is also culture uh, i mean localization is not just uh, i think language but 
yeah, I mean, you're you're definitely uh, on point there. All right. Uh, next question is from Praveen. Uh, what's your opinion about mixed reality based immersive games, which would require a costly device like Microsoft Microsoft Hololens? How much time do you think it takes for this kind of technology to become affordable and accessible for the masses? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of Hololens. I think they've done a phenomenal job in terms of the tech itself. All I can tell you is all the experts have been wrong on the timelines in the past, <laughs> so, but I will still hazard a guess and say five years. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, when it happens, like I think the whole spatial tech, basically uh, interacting with space around you and building experiences around you, whenever that happens, that is fundamentally more powerful than even VR because you can actually do a lot more without wearing anything, right? Like it's projecting out of a phone or uh, whatever and, and uh, I think just HoloLens remains like a bulky device still. Like, but like I said, if we can get to a contact lens or something like that, or if we go to spatial tech, I think we can get there faster. All right. Thanks for asking this question, Praveen. Uh, moving on to the question asked by Kazim. What adds to virality of a game? Uh, one factor he, I am seeing is multiplayer ability and streaming friendly is common among the major games like uh, Genshin Impact, PUBG Mobile, and Among Us. What? what yeah, this uh, definitely not a question I can answer in a minute, but I'll try. Yeah, take, no, um, we can take two minutes on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think the virality of a game is basically, I think what we miss is it needs to be extremely unique. It needs to be something that the world hasn't seen before. Like, I think that is very, very important. Uh, I mean, you take it any viral phenomenon, right? It only is viral because it's an experience nobody has ever had before. So what that means is we can't brainstorm like we do and see, take inspirations from the real world or copy other things that exist, right? It means going deep down into our uh, you know, into our, into our experiences and saying, what can make a viral experience? I think that is is the hardest part. And that's where, you know, the that separates the great games from the good games. Like, I mean, how did Pokemon Go become viral? Because, I mean, you'd never anticipated that such a thing existed, right? Like, um, I think that is one. Like, uh, the aspects that you're talking about are, I would say, platform level stuff, right? Like, great tech, ability to stream, all of that exists. The, the thing that I want to highlight a uh, couple more things like for a viral game to succeed is, you know, the, the, the gratification in the game. Like when you play the game, when you have the win moment and uh, you know, you get there, like how gratifying is it? If that's extremely gratifying, your chances of success become a lot more, right? Yeah. If it's, if, it, if it's middling, it doesn't like you know help at the same time you could even have lost moments that hurt you a lot i mean both ways if it can trigger an extreme emotion in the yeah. player yeah, that is what you're looking for so viral games trigger extreme emotion right uh, and unfortunately sometimes in a negative way but they are still a viral game right we're not saying we're not judging the game but we are looking at the virality of the game the third one is there are basic game economics that should work right and I'll give you just one equation that you should look for, right? Which is what we call as RPI greater than CPI, which is revenue per install needs to be greater than cost per install. Very simple math, right? The money you make from the game should be greater than the cost it took you to acquire that install. So the unit economics of that particular player engaging with your game needs to be good. And if you get these three things together, you have a viral hit. Of course, all easier said than done, but that's my view on virality. All right. Um, now, Prera wants to ask you that, how can a particular game sustain for a longer time, like 10 plus year in the market? Uh, example, how can online apps for Uno or Chess or Ludo earn similar revenue post pandemic? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is like, uh, uh, like a, a, not a million, but a billion dollar question, right? Like, and I'm sitting behind a game that has made a billion dollars. Yes. dollars like uh, Farmville, Farmville has like existed for more than 10 years and made a billion dollars so it is definitely a very very hard question but I think some of the, it is to stay true to the science of game building right uh, you know being player first and we have actually very systematic ways of building games and if you follow all the rules of that process right and and be player first and fix the game so that 
you know, the first 10 levels are engaging before you go on and build a game. Then you have extremely good narrative, which connects with the user. Then you have the systems that will reward the users and essentially link up to higher order systems over time, uh, where even like the elder players, as we call them, which is people in the later levels in the game, also are finding systems to unlock. Basically, there is, you know, if you have this aspect of hope in the game where, you know, you, you can look up to something, you have aspiration in the game that keeps continuing over time, there is no reason why it can't continue. But I think this whole uh, ability to be unique and connect with the users very deeply becomes very important, right? Um, like I think a chess.com, for instance, there was an interesting story of, um, you know, just, a, just an aside, but how like Queen's Gambit uh, took chess.com uh, to 5x of what they were, right? Like, I think things like that are, are interesting things that I'm seeing in the pandemic where, uh, you know, people are using unconventional marketing tools, uh, maybe not even by intention. Yeah. And, and actually uh, scaling up in, in unconventional ways. And, and if you're able to do that consistently over time, maybe it'll sustain, but uh, if you're not solving for an inherent user problem, which is something that the user cares about, I mean, it's not going to matter. I think that's still going to be the number one priority. All right. Uh, now the next question is from Sneha. Uh, do you expect a multiplayer game? Do you expect a multiplayer games with casual games, given Zynga has forayed into that space with Rolic? Yeah, that's a great question because my team is building something similar. Uh, and uh, we are we are building new mass market what we call hybrid casual games, which is hyper casual games with more retention. Um, I mean, the short answer is yes. Like, and, uh, you know, I do have see it happening very soon. All right. So maybe you can wait for some more time and watch watch out for an update on Zynga's yes. social media page. We are up for something very soon. Now, the second last question is from Siddharth. Uh, my seven-year-old does random stuff on Scratch 3.0. What should you suggest? Suggest Should I give guide him on the next things to do? Um, I would like, one, like, um, I think that's an amazing time, like, for the child to just explore and be random. Like, I strongly advise to keep the randomness. Like, I think... That is where I think the curiosity of the child, um, you know, helps them unlock and learn in a slow way. I mean, we as adults are always goal-based, right? Like we want to learn something, we want to move here, we want to move there. But the chil children learn in their own unique way. I would say don't try to like, uh, you know, bound it in any particular way. I would, as long as the child is curious and, you know, exploring more of Scratch, that's a great place to be in. Uh, if you're able to... In inspire them with experiences that they want to build, that would be a great place. And if they're inspired enough by the experiences and they want to come and build, um, you know, on scratch, that's a good place. I would not look at scratch as a skill. Like, I think that's the main difference in my uh, approach here. Uh, I think children will learn skills as they grow up, right? Uh, it's more important to kind of encourage their curiosity and let them explore deeper even if the outcome is just a muddled thing, right? which like as adults, we don't understand. Like, and that's how, I mean, when you look at great games, uh, you know, they're not built by conventional thinking. So, I mean, I'm just kind of marrying that to games and saying like, I would encourage that a lot. Okay. Um, so uh, now that we have answered almost all the questions I have, so, Reen, I'm really sorry I can't take your question now because of some time constraints, but I'll make sure that I'll get the answer of this and I'll email it to you from Akshay. Like, I'll make sure I'll, I'll get the answer from Akshay and email it to you. So, don't worry about this. Uh, before we leave, uh, one last quick uh, word which you can say for anyone because uh, one of the attendees also asked the same question that for anyone who is thinking of entering the gaming industry as a fresher maybe or an experienced guy, What's your uh, suggestion to them uh, if they are doing that? Play a lot of games um, and just think about how games are built, right? And uh, we don't hire people who don't play games. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, so play a lot of games, think about how they are built um, and build your own perspectives and opinions on games, right? Be passionate about what you like. And that's the passion we want in our studios. Um, All right. 
Perfect. And before we leave, uh, which game are you playing currently? Uh, currently playing a lot, but uh, you know the game I have behind me. Uh, you know we are testing that a lot. Uh, you know Farm Three. Uh, it's soft launched in India. Uh, I mean you should try it out. We are also we've also soft launched. Uh, you know a few games. I can't name it for technical reasons. I mean because they are not officially under Zynga, but uh, playing some of those too. But I do hope to make them public in a month or two. Perfect. Uh, all right. So yeah, this brings us to the end of session. Thank you, Akshay. Uh, for uh, accepting my invite and appearing on this fireside chat. Uh, we haven't met in person, but I expect to hope to see you soon uh, in the office, maybe, or somewhere in Bangalore. I guess you are in Bangalore. I am in Bangalore, yes. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, thanks for uh, joining us today. And for